The search for alien life in the universe is one of the most fascinating pursuits in the history of humankind. Since we first stopped and stared at the night sky with wonder, an enduring question has always been at the forefront, driving our exploration. Are we alone? Well, maybe now, tantalising new results from our sister planet, Venus, may point towards an answer to that question. The discovery of life beyond Earth has been conjured up in numerous fashions by science fiction writers throughout the ages, and normally we are left in no doubt that extraterrestrial life is real. However, the scientific search has followed a more exhaustive and rigorous path, from scouring images of the Martian surface, spectral analyses of Saturnian moons, to analysing the atmospheric chemistries of extrasolar planets. The path is well mapped out, with any possible indicators of biological activity or biospheres being subject to numerous checks, the highest levels of scrutiny, before any claims will be made. In fact, providing a positive response to the question of alien life is far from trivial, and should never be, since the implications are so profound and fundamental to everything that we are. Now, recent focus has been on Mars. We have attacked the Red Planet with orbiters, rovers, studied the surface and atmosphere from Earth, characterising in detail our neighbouring world to better understand the formation and evolution of planets, whilst also searching for evidence of past or present life. And with many signs pointing in a positive direction, Mars will likely continue to occupy prime position in our search. However, these new results coming from studies investigating the atmosphere of our sister planet Venus may change the long-term focus in the search for life beyond Earth, and it all hinges on a simple molecule called phosphine. Phosphine may not sound like your typical biosignature gas, which are those gases that are common tracers of a life-hosting biosphere, and that show, of course, spectroscopic signatures that can be characterised from afar. Typical examples being oxygen, O2, or methane, CH4, but even though phosphine is not naturally abundant in the Earth's atmosphere, being just a trace gas, if we want to expand the limits of our search, we must think beyond the confines of our own cradle. We must decrease the narrow view given by our golden ticket bias. One focus from work by Clara Sousa Silver and collaborators at MIT set out to evaluate the possible role of phosphine gas as a biomarker in anoxic planets, which are those planets with low oxygen abundances, where oxygen would have a limited role in the existence of any life within that world. Phosphine has already been detected in the atmospheres of Jupiter and Saturn in our own solar system, Along with other bodies in the cosmos, like carbon stars and brown dwarfs, however the work by Sousa Silva et al. aimed at evaluating it particularly as a biosignature gas in more temperate locales, conditions more similar to the Earth. That is to say, would the detection of high levels of phosphine in a potentially habitable planet be the smoking gun confirmation that life exists on such a world? With the chemical symbol PH3, phosphine is a molecule that bounds phosphorus to three hydrogen atoms and is a trigonal pyramidal molecule. On Earth we know that all life requires phosphorus compounds to survive, but with the exact role of phosphine in this process still little known. However, previous thermodynamic studies of phosphine production in temperate environments did not find known pathways for abiotic production in any significant amounts. And so it provides a possible biosignature gas with no known false positives for the presence of life. So in their work, the team used a well-established photochemical model to generate the expected spectral pattern of phosphine in modelled anoxic exoplanets. They were able to tailor their experiment to predict what spectral profiles we might be able to detect using, for instance, the James Webb Space Telescope, near-infrared and mid-infrared observations, placing limits on the amounts necessary in these atmospheres such that we would confidently detect the presence of the molecule in either transmission spectra or direct emission spectra. In their study, they focused on worlds with mean temperatures of around 15 degrees Celsius, but also tested a small range of temperatures 
values from 0 degrees to 30 degrees. They found for their carbon dioxide worlds and hydrogen dominated worlds that phosphine is only weakly dependent on temperature. Furthermore, and key to the nature of the result we are discussing here, the number of false positives is found to be very low. The reduction of phosphate or phosphite to phosphine was considered in their work, and for typical geochemical conditions, the calculated Gibbs free energy necessary for the formation of phosphine renders it a thermodynamically disfavoured pathway, without a biological catalyst. In addition, lightning was considered, whereby lightning strikes could reduce phosphorus. However, lab experiments show that only a small amount of phosphine can be produced in these types of environments. What about volcanism? Although phosphine is not known to be created through volcanism on Earth, their experiments suggest only small amounts could be produced on an anoxic Earth. Finally, phosphine delivery riding on meteorites and pinging on the planet was also considered. They assumed an average meteoric fraction of phosphorus of 0.25% by weight, that all this could be hydrolysized into phosphine, and with their delivery rates, they could produce around 10 tons of phosphine per year to the modeled planet. A very small amount indeed. Now the conclusions then drawn from this study and the others previous experiments that they drew from were that non-biological processes find it difficult to maintain high concentrations of phosphine in temperate atmospheres. Amounts high enough for remote detections of the gas in anoxic atmospheres. And so that brings us to a result now much closer to home, our sister planet Venus. A world in many ways similar to the Earth, but also much more hostile. It has a mass of about 80% that of our planet, and radius of about 95%, and as a second planet from the Sun, the Venusian year is 225 days long, and its day is 243 Earth days long, meaning its day lasts longer than its year. More interestingly is the atmospheric characteristics since it is a very dense atmosphere that gives rise to a surface pressure that is similar to the pressure nearly one kilometre below sea level on Earth, over 90 times that of Earth's surface pressure. Furthermore, such a dense atmosphere also gives rise to intense surface temperatures on Venus. With a mean temperature of around 450 degrees Celsius, it is hot enough to melt lead. The atmosphere of Venus is made up of around 96% carbon dioxide, 3% nitrogen and some other trace gases. It is within this mix of trace gases that the planet may really come alive, so to speak. Sulfur dioxide makes up part of this mix, with around 80% of the clouds on Venus made up of this gas, giving rise to a layer of sulfuric acid rain that falls within the planet. And now also we have a significant abundance of phosphine, the potential hard biomarker gas. It seems to be present in the Venusian atmosphere. So the discovery of phosphine in Venus was made by a team led by Professor Jane Greaves from Cardiff University in Wales, using the James Clerk Maxwell Telescope, or JCMT, at the Mauna Kea Observatory in Hawaii, and also the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, in northern Chile. Now, although we say significant amounts of phosphine have been discovered, the modelling of the signal that you can see here in red for the data taken with the JCMT returns an abundance of only 20 parts per billion, which means that there is only 20 phosphine molecules for every billion gas particles that exist in the atmosphere. The spectral signature of phosphine shown here is found at radio wavelengths of 1.123 millimetres, and therefore to further confirm the signal was real, the team also observed Venus with ALMA at higher spectral resolution, showing the robustness of the JCMT detection. Independent detections are key to confirm the reality of scientific discoveries. So we can take the result at face value. This is a lovely detection of phosphine in our nearest neighbour planet Venus. But it is the implications of the discovery that could be groundbreaking. If we find it difficult to explain the abundance of the molecule through more traditional means, then we need to think more exotically. We already mentioned that biological processes could produce high levels of this gas, high levels of phosphine, in anoxic exoplanets. But what about Venus? 
Well, for over 50 years we have entertained the notion that Venus could be considered a possible habitable planet. Some believe that billions of years ago, before the runaway greenhouse effect that has made the planet hostile kicked in, Venus was much more hospitable to life, maybe even hosting surface liquid water that could support life as we know it. But what about now? Well, if life is to exist, it likely must be hosted high in the atmosphere, at altitudes where the pressures and temperatures are more Earth-like. If we consider clouds at altitudes of around, say, 50 kilometres, we may have temperatures of around 20 degrees centigrade and pressures of 1 bar, Earth's surface pressure. Therefore, we can propose a life cycle here, whereby whatever life there could be would be trapped and protected inside the sulfuric acid rain droplets. And this protection is critical since we would expect life to quickly lose any liquid it maintains to the environment and so wouldn't last very long. The life we must consider in this case would require a longevity of millions to billions of years, and so existing in droplets is crucial. These droplets then fall down to lower and deeper levels in the atmosphere due to gravity, reaching altitudes of maybe 35 to 45 kilometers. Now as the temperature increases towards the surface of the planet, the rain will eventually evaporate out below the cloud layer which could give rise to a haze layer full of spores, and since the spores are now much lighter, they can be lifted back up into the upper atmosphere again through upward diffusion due to gravity waves, finding their way inside the acidic droplets to begin the entire cycle all over again. This life cycle was actually proposed by one of the authors of the paper, Professor Sarah Seeger from MIT and her collaborators, in a companion work and follows a similar process that occurs here on Earth, where life is caught in updrafts, drawn from the surface of the Earth, and that life can stay suspended in air for around a week or so. Of course, as mentioned, the process on Venus must be much longer lived. And since the clouds on Venus are permanently present, the process could follow suit, providing a long-lived habitat. It should be noted that any such life, if present, is likely to be drastically different to life on Earth, since the extremely acidic nature of Venus would quickly destroy panspermic life brought from Earth, and therefore, again we must consider more exotic life forms. So wherever the ball lands here, and history has shown us that these types of results inevitably have a more mundane, but no less rich and rewarding origin. Just head back to the furor in the 90s surrounding the possible discovery of fossilised life in the Allen Hills meteor to understand the difficulties in proposing evidence for extraterrestrial biology. And these were lab samples, not remote detections. In fact, just one week after the launch of this result, a short paper appeared that describes another possible pathway that could explain this level of phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Ingog Truong and Jonathan Lunin from Cornell put forward a model that the phosphine in the atmosphere is being continuously pumped there by surface geologic activity in the form of bellowing volcanoes that are spewing out material into the Venusian atmosphere. Now these volcanoes would need to pump out around 30 billion kilograms of phosphides each year into the atmosphere. That would be to fulfill the 20 parts per billion signal requirement detected by the JCMT and ALMA. And the researchers estimate this is around 2 to 3 percent of the total phosphorus content that exists. So in this scenario, phosphine is not pointing towards the existence of exotic life on Venus, but a thriving geological activity on our sister planet which would be super exciting in itself. Of course, these results also require some underlying assumptions, like the lifetime of phosphine in Venus's atmosphere, for example, which the researchers set to be one year in this case. And therefore, more modelling needs to be done to confirm this is a suitable explanation of reality. One can never disprove something they don't know to exist. In these cases, there are always the X factors, new and radical pathways to explain large abundances of biosignature gases in planets, like phosphine. But even that would be something special, something that would change the way we view the chemistry and physical processes of worlds in the cosmos. In any case, a new avenue of research has been opened, 
an avenue that will galvanise observational astronomers and theoreticians alike in order to understand the boundaries and possibilities for life in our own solar system and of course beyond. We can hope a new wave of interest will be focused on Venus, returning spacecraft equipped with robotic laboratories to analyse the gases in situ, Bloom-born microlabs that could scour the proposed hazy layer, that could scoop up phosphine and other possible gases to determine their true nature. And if we are really to convince ourselves of the reality of alien life, if that is what we are entertaining here, then these laboratories may have to grasp that life themselves, analysing it on board and proving once and for all that we are not alone in the universe. Until then, we will continue to wonder what secrets planets like Venus hold. We will continue to work to better understand how we can confirm or not if life exists elsewhere in the universe. The hard truth may be that it will never be possible from afar, and so we must explore Venus, Mars and other worlds in great detail from within those worlds themselves. Alien life, it seems, may require alien evidence. Good night.